Uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted you to sort of tell me about your your latest project from two, 2016, but also the antecedents that led into it, uh, like Not School. If you could tell people who don't know about these things, who probably, you know, know all about the Oak National Academy and all the sort of thing that's happened very recently. But... Um, Tell us, tell us the history of, of, of Not School, which was extremely successful. It was, it was, um, it was absolutely fab. So Not School started off in 1997. I was sitting on the Standards Task Force with a, a number of, of uh, incoming ministers. Uh, Labour got in in 97. I helped write some of the um, policy for that. And um, uh, no, not that I'm, I'm happy to work with any party, really, but uh, they reached out. And... Um, I was sitting in a, at a standards task force meeting with the permanent secretary, who I won't name because he'd be slightly embarrassed by, by the, what happened. Um, and he said to me something quite sniffy about children who'd been excluded from school, along the lines of some social rights, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I said I didn't believe that to be true. And if he was to give me a hundred of them, I could show them how good they can be, you know, as a throwaway kind of hevel comment over coffee. So he said, all right, <laughs> here's a hundred excluding kids. <laughs> good luck, you know. <laughs> so um, we we worked with a lot of people in the, the first year or so, the Worldwide Fund of Nature, BBC, the Science Museum, and we thought we could build a, a learning environment for children who were wholly at home. Um, and initially, we thought we could do that and re-engage them with education. Um, but later, we came to realize we could re-engage them with learning, but putting them back into the schools that had scarred them in the first place. You know, <laughs> you've been abused by your stepdad. You know, we'll, we'll give you a fortnight by the sea and put you back in the bedroom. You know, it, it didn't seem appropriate. You know, so not that that isn't that's an extreme analogy. Really, but some of them had had pretty tough times. They really you know. And some were just excluded by circumstances. You know, there were school refusers, wouldn't come out of the bedroom. For everyone had been in the bedroom for 18 months. Parents had had to put a chemical toilet in. So we started with a blank sheet of paper and, and just wanted to delight them with their learning. We gave them all a computer at home. In those days, a big shiny iMac. There was something about opening the box and, you know, how good after packaging or something about opening the box and this. And they kept saying, this is mine, you know. You, you mean I own it? And we said, yeah, yeah. You mean I could sell it? Well, you could, but you wouldn't be able to do the project, you know. <laughs> and, and we only ever lost one, I think, in the whole, you know, 10 years, 1,000 kids a year. And the way the one, one we had taken away by drug dealers coming to the, 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 the money back from the mum who was in a coma in the corner. But even that one, we just sent the big lad up to have a word with them. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of money changed hands for saving face, and we came back to the computer. You know. <laughs> There's always ways. You know. So the, the joy of the thing, really, was that um, kids were hungry to learn, of course. And we started with the things they wanted to learn. Uh, and one of them said to me, when you're really crap at something at school, then they can do more of it. <laughs> they do. <laughs> you know, and... Um, and of course, what we've seen with just jumping briefly to the lockdown is that kids with technology at home are pursuing the things they're passionate about in, in considerable detail. You know, my, my little six-year-old, I live in the grandchildren, she's become passionate about space and rockets. I can probably see actually just behind me there on top of the pinball machine, oh, yeah. on top of the leg. We do. There's a space rocket. <laughs> I'm rebuilding the pinball machine. She's off into space. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that stage of not age, that sense you can go and fire as fast as you like, I think was, was very apparent even in those early days. So very quickly, with the thing grew, we had, um, we found all over the country there were teachers who wanted to teach but didn't want to be in school. They, they had enough of the paperwork, they'd been bullied, they had... Um, you know, they'd had to go off with their partner for a thousand reasons. <clears throat> but they were still passionate about poetry or sort of mad about you know, moraines or, or whatever, you know. And, and um, 
I remember that curious after the girl who was doing poetry that was going around Birmingham on a narrowboat. And um, she didn't want to teach him in school, but she was working with kids about poetry. It was like, let me at it. Um, and the bottom line was it worked. The kids, by and large, as a cohort, been about a thousand kids a year. The cost of the project was only what they would have cost to be in regular school. It wasn't, it wasn't um, referral unit kind of funding, it was just you know, the weighted pupil uh, number. And it was been brilliant. And um, it got increasingly difficult in the department to get the money to fund it because they kept saying, well, we've given the money to the schools. And we'd say, yeah, but the schools have thrown the kids out. <laughs> and now the kids are on the street and the school's got the money. That's not right. We, we sounded a lot of la- alarms with Ofsted about informal exclusions and off-rolling. That was all, in fact, 2011, we warned them about off-rolling. So then that, that sort of led us when we got to um, free schools. And I was quite taken with some of the rhetoric of free schools. I mean... You know, I'm passionate about education, I love schools, I love teachers, but, you know, when Michael Gove was saying, imagine a school at the end of your road where everybody knows your name, I thought, well, yeah, we, we could use some of that. <laughs> and um, a lot of what we've learned from Knox um, about how the children interacted with content, about, you know, you needed a proper teacher to make sure that his entries were in on time and, you know, and of course, there was coursework back in those days. We used to trust teachers and children. You know, there was coursework, so kids would produce. I mean, <laughs> there's a kind of uh, a sorrow in all this that so many of the decisions made in the last ten years were were catastrophic in, like, in the context of the pandemic. You know, they might have been in terms of ideology or whatever. They might have been the right decisions, but taking coursework away when the kids can't sit in an exam room together. Seems to me to be a spectacularly bad, you know, bullet to the foot. <laughs> but then we're, we're in that position now, aren't we? In a sense, we, <laughs> there are there are no exams. No, well, I mean, the kids in not school couldn't sit in the exam room with the other kids because they'd probably knifed one of them, you know, <laughs> or the teacher, you know, and now they can't sit there because they're infected, you know, all this danger. So, so we kind of. We kind of revisited all this and we said, you know what, if we were building Knox School fresh, we could do it even better. And we put a proposal to the, um, to the government, to the free school folk, called Scholar Liberum, which is Latin for free school. I'm amazed that nobody else had taken the, uh, the domain, you know, but <laughs> I guess the free school folk didn't know a lot of Latin. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and, um, and we said, look, there are two compelling reasons why we should do this over and above the fact that it works. One is, schools are dangerous places. And I've just come back from the um, Marjorie Southern Douglas school with 17 empty desks and the kids were shot, you know. And because we got work in Africa, so we'd lost people in Nigeria and stuff, you know. So, you know, when people want to hurt the culture, <clears throat> they hurt the children. So I said, look, school's dangerous places. It wouldn't take very many terrorist attacks in England before kids stopped going to school for a while. But also, there were pandemics. And, you know, the pandemic came along. You know, something about 20% of the population would have to stop work because the kids would be home. And uh, we wrote all this in the document. You know. And the department said, well, we don't, we don't recognise the danger. <laughs> But, but we did, <laughs> and look, we were right as usual. You know. <laughs> so um, we've got it out and dusted it off again. And of course, it's really interesting now because um, there's a ton of content now. When we first did it, you know, we had Bite Size and Khan Academy, and but now there's the, the you know Oak Academy. There's a million companies that just made their stuff available for free or cheap. Uh, ABC in Australia, BBC here. Broadcasters have rediscovered their charter. You know, BBC charter was you know, educating for. They kind of stopped doing the education bit. But boy, are they back at the vengeance now. And I'm quite happy to hear have Brian Cox telling my six year old about uh, gravity. You know, he does it better than I can. 
So um, there's more content, a lot more content. Technology is better. Uh, we were in '97. Only barely got the internet. In those days, you know. So um, April '93, the source code for the web was released. You know, so we were only four years on from that. And um, you know, we didn't have Skype and Zoom. We had to do clever things with hypercarbon cameras on the back of. And just wrote it all ourselves, you know, it all worked. But I think it's that easy going with the writing. <laughs> yes, I remember and, um, I remember being on the C U C me server, which uh, which was didn't have any any audio, so we held up big cards with magic yeah. marker crayons to communicate with each other. And because ironically that's all back because you know, now we've got distancing in schools and the teachers can't walk over to the kids to look at their books. So the kids have all now got you know, clipboards they're holding up with their masks on it. The teacher's going, yeah, that looks about right. You know, <laughs> you, know you can't write much of pie because the board's not big enough. You know, <laughs> yeah, what, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? But, but so, also, one of the big changes, and, and folks who've been involved with home education will know this, that there was a time when the home educator had to give up an income. So you had to be pretty wealthy um, or live poor as church, right? You know, so, you know, if mum gives up her income, and particularly as a single parent family, um, then you know, there's no other way of doing it because, um, you know, you've got to look after them. Uh, well, now, of course, we've got half the nation working from home. And, and they ain't going back. That gene is out of the bottle. I talked to my neighbour this morning. We shout across the road at each other. <laughs> we both got boats, so we're getting excited about the thought of getting on the water again. And um, people are saying, I suppose you'll be getting back on a plane soon, Stephen. That's not nearly as often as I used to. <laughs> this, is, this is far too nice. And I'm loving the time with the ground. We got chickens, you know. <laughs> we go past, go past the window now. You know, it's rather turning, turning into the good life here, you know, in every sense. <laughs> So people are going to be working from home. Well, there are only two reasons to send your kids to school other than it's fun. You know, one is somebody's going to look after them while they go to work, or not anymore. And two is, you know, there's all the camaraderie of, you know, role play and wrestling with each other and not anymore. So, uh, you know, if I'm going to school to sit at a desk and do online learning, the same as my mate staying at home to do, why would I go? And so I think there's a substantial need, not I, mean, I still love schools, but I think some children will stay at home. And, and, and part, of, part of the not school um, strength was the fact of the, the tutoring, the interactions between the people who were chosen to sort of to, to interact with, with the children and those relationships. And how does that yeah. how does that carry over the small scale of things? Well, it's it's key, and and of course, what you end up with is you build you build a card of people who are capable and confident. But of course, you've got the world is your oyster. So, you know, we we we, were, we had children there who would be who wouldn't get up till lunchtime. They would go to bed at two or three a.m. No problem because people in New Zealand could look after them. Um, in the daytime, you know, and we distinguish between the people who looked after the administration of, you need to have your four pieces of coursework, and you need to then do your exam, you need to do this, and the people who were passionate about their subject, and the kids were getting deep, proper deep knowledge from those folks, and, you know, their, their, their education here and their learning here, if you like. Um, and that's what we're saying with Scholar Libera, we're saying, uh, in all honesty, the parent is, is there as the lead responsible adult and they need another adult with them because we're clustering children rather than having, you know, one kid in one house and one in another. They say, no, you know, six families get together and, uh, you know, I think the kids can come here for Monday, they can come to you for Tuesday and they're probably going to go to the museum the botanical gardens Wednesday and Thursday morning. Um, that's just fine. And the way that flexible working is, you know, for wealthy and not wealthy people, the zero hours going through to 
what used to be professions, you know, finding a half day when you don't work and just working a bit longer than the other four and a half is easy peasy. For some, not for everybody. So, you know, we've been, we're talking about these little clusters of, of kids together in, in places and we're not building premises for them. So we haven't got to have one of the funny things with the department was they said, look, you'll have to have gendered toilets. You know? He said, you got gendered toilets in your home? You know? <laughs> 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 I did once say that at a conference, you know, when I was talking about the foolishness of all this. And I said, who here, about 600 people, you know, who here has got a gender toilet? Don't put his hand up. I said, blind me, where do you live? I live in a castle. <laughs> <laughs> For people who don't live in a castle, mostly we share the same toilet. <laughs> so they found it very hard in the department to make the, the form they got fit the school. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the problem is because, again, it's almost sort of outside the constraints or the bounds of schools. It's it's a bit like recombinant DNA. You can take from here and put in there. And that kind of um, way of looking at education is 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 outside of the bounds in many ways. Yeah, and it may be you know, that, that we end up on building it outside of the bounds altogether. I think we... We don't think we're going to need government money for it, so um, and we think it's going to be global. And uh, you know, off we go. I mean, I'm sure there was a moment when Amazon stopped worrying about whether they're going to have to pay business rates because they didn't have any premises. And um, you know, that's that's where we are. But I mean, also we found interestingly some companies who are saying, you know, the people who do come to work. It's jolly awkward when they have to drop off the kids somewhere, then get here, then be back to pick them up at 3.30. It'd be really handy if we had school in the company. Uh, this is the way that the Guinness factory and you know, Cadbury folk used to do 100 years or more ago. But of course you can't do that, but we can do that if the cluster is only six or seven kids. So you know, instead of take your daughter to work, that sort of patronising, who looked here? This is what work ethic looks like once a year. You know, kids are there with you working, and uh, you have to go on a bit in the evening, or they have to go on a bit in the evening. You can just make it work for both of you. And so, and of course, it can fit. It can fit in with the existing sort of fluid situation that's happening in many ways. Because I think part part of the problem is that people are now talking about an open, a national open school, which again is sort of a centralised um, model. And 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 in many ways, the, the virus itself isn't centralised. It travels in clusters. That's you know that's the that's the fascinating thing about all this, is that that's how that knowledge is could be spread in local clusters. Yeah. And I was a huge fan. I mean, Jenny Lee, you know, nineteen sixty eight, looking brilliant. Wilson government, you know, the, the best thing that government did was the Open University. And kind of looking back, it's sort of built upside down now, you know, because it was built around providing high quality and fabulous content. And when you walked in there, there were corridors of, you know, smart academics doing, you know, diagrams of geography textbooks or whatever, you know. And, and of course, the OU then kind of franchised out the argument. So you had FE colleges and people around the country where the students would go for their evenings or the summer schools or whatever. And that turned out to be the magical bit. You know, it's... it's I mean, not in a world where content is king. We're in a world where, you know, community is sovereign and collaboration is, is essence, you know, and mutuality and essence, and those are the key words. And there's another really interesting thing here. But, you know, if I think about the technology I've got in my hand on the wall in this little office um, here, what is it good at? You know, it's really good at repetition. It's really good at doing what it's told. It's really, really good at uh, not making mistakes. It's really good at, um, well, all those things that we've been asking children to do in schools for too long. Why would kids need to, you know, regurgitate and replicate and repeat? Computers are always going to be them like that. However, the things we're good at, um, ingenuity, creativity, deep learning, Playfulness, curiosity, 
computers are rubbish at that. I've yet to meet a curio. You know, I buy houses of wash with talking devices, you can imagine. You know. <laughs> None of them are very curious, you know. I ask them, the kids ask them to tell, tell a joke or make a noise like a rude raspberry, you know. But, 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 but they never ask the kids anything, you know. <laughs> so people are going to notice. Now, what we've discovered, of course, in, the, in this extraordinary month with the virus, when it seems to me like the work I've been doing for the last, the last 30 years has all happened in a month. You know. so I've done it and shown it and scaled it and proved it. And then, well, you have to do it again. You just have to keep repeating. Suddenly, everybody's saying, you know what? It should be like this. You know. Well, what's fascinating about that is, is the kids have discovered playfulness and ingenuity and creativity. They've discovered you. you know, I, was, I was in a, a Zoom chat with some kids the other day. We're chatting away, and suddenly one of the kids, she, she arrives with a cup of coffee and puts it down and goes out because the kid, the kid recorded a video of herself walking in with a cup of coffee and putting it on the desk and going out. And she's running this as a virtual background. We don't see it as a virtual background, doesn't we? So she's chatting, and suddenly she comes in, gives herself a cup of coffee, and it's brilliant at the moment. You know? and, uh, I've never seen an adult do that. Well, kids are all passing bananas from window to window. It's like celebrity squares on steroids. You know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see. Well, it's good to see, but they're not going to go, that gene is not going to go back in the bottom. They're not going to go back and sit in a row and be distanced and, and do what they're told and, and be told. You know, my little granddaughter isn't going to be told you can't do that stuff on space yet because that's a secondary topic. You know, she, she knows more about the flipping rings of Saturn than I do. Um, you know, we're out lying on our backs in the garden watching the Star Train go past or the International Space Station or whatever. She wasn't going to do that as a six-year-old in primary school. So they discovered stage and age and depth. But crucially, they've discovered the things that they're good at and computers are. That's what we want. Yeah. You know, and I think the education system that's been making little computers isn't what we want. We want an education system to make it proper, clever people. What, 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 what is a worry about this um, lockdown is that there are a lot of kids out there who aren't doing anything online and may not have access or may not have... Um, the connection, but but you you tackle that in in not school with having specific mentors who followed up, didn't you? In that sense, yeah, we did, and, and it was also. I mean, it was complex, and it is complex. I mean, the equity issue, you know, for example, people talk about equity as though the only problem with kids who haven't got bandwidth or haven't got money. I mean, probably it would, it's almost impossible to hold down a zero hours contract job without a mobile phone. So. Somebody in the house has got a phone with that data, which they didn't have in 97. But the disequity is much more, um, you know, my, my school has decided to do synchronous lessons. So we all sit there and, good morning, it's Mr. Smith teaching RE. Unfortunately, my mum's also online at that point because she's got a Zoom meeting with her colleagues. And I'm looking after the two kids. So if I've got to do that, I'm going to miss the lesson. So we know that online activity is very rarely effectively synchronous. It's nice occasion to have a little moment at a hero's assembly at the end of the week or, you know, a lot of teachers did a kind of May the 4th be with you kind of Star Wars themed, you know, cleanery or whatever. But mostly you, you warn the kids of tasks coming, you give them a period for completion, and then as you get towards the end of that period, you say, don't forget, you've got to finish. And then when they complete, you put it somewhere and you have a virtual gallery and, you know, constructed this model of, Learning says you, you celebrate and exhibit and share. And, you know, if you don't do that, if you try and do it all synchronously, you will have a serious equity issue with the kids who can't do it synchronously. And that's sometimes about money, but it's more often about the social dynamic of where they are. And, you know, I've got my Just funny enough, yesterday, talking to schools about their participation rates online. And the ones that have got their participation rates up in the, you know, well into the mid 90s, are the ones that are going for asynchronous, put up the activity. The ones that are struggling down in the sort of 60s or worse, uh, you know, what they mean by online is somebody logged on and logged out, you know. <laughs> oh, I can tell you, and I was talking to these kids the other about them, how they cope with this, the, the boredom of all this, you know, and one of them said, I just, I've got an animated kid, I mean, just, 
just nodding. And I just I just said that's a background. And my girlfriend did something. You see that? So the teacher's got a hold on the screen. She's mm, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> just nodding away. You know. <laughs> And that, that, that kids are so um, ingenious about all this, you know. But we're not sure we have to put the line into the house because the houses or the flats or whatever um, were not allowed a BT anything because they were all on debt registers and they've got, you know, money and judgment. So we, and it's really hard, we had to own the line and pay the bills in somebody else's house. And that wasn't fair to invent all that. I found that Mike Damiano, the guy, we did, we did all that. It is now helping me with the um, Stella Liberum because although those problems aren't very deep, yeah, parts of the world, they are quite big problems. And of course, this time around, we're building it global because why wouldn't you? you know? <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting you said that because that is the one practical thing you have to do to reach people, you know, apart from posting um, worksheets through their letterbox or whatever, you know. That's 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 the one thing that you can sort of turn the key to open up access to these things. But I also found things like the the the, the Oak uh, Academy. The one thing they don't do is allow uh, the the assets to be disaggregated. So so far they haven't allowed the films to be downloaded. So you can use them locally later if you've got a poor line or something like that. It's 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 an interesting concept. Well, I'm, I'm not going to criticise anybody no, no. because everybody's trying their best. No, I think it's wonderful. It's just one particular thing I wondered about. Lots, lots of teachers have had a go, but I mean, clearly that model is not where this is going. No. It might be handy. Them, but, it's but, but your model can supplement or even sort of, you know, fill in a lot of things around that. And and this is what gets me. It's like um, you could have the curriculum, but you could also cluster, you know, activities and ideas around that in small groups of of children. Yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly right. And also, of course, it's really good that they provided content, but that's one more thing out there that the kids can use. So you need a kind of, what in the old days would have been a librarian, but now I think it's probably a curator. To, to, because there are crazy folk out there who will produce content too. You know, and I don't want my kids learning from somebody who's a little world flattened. You know, we're all descended from Martians or whatever. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a measure of work. Maybe, maybe we are. <laughs> I've, I've seen a few politicians and maybe wonder, I'll tell you. But, you know, <laughs> but let's assume that, you know, we want kids to see the best of knowledge and the best of science and the best of what's there. And that sort of matters. In our very early days of um, doing online children working together, and it's always a two-way street. We had kids in the, in the United States and kids in Sweden um, doing some online projects together. And uh, it all hit a bit of a bump in the road when they got to doing um, uh, evolution because the American kids were, they had a very different model culturally of evolution from the Swedish kids. And the Swedish kids were frankly gobsmacked, you know, so we, we just had this sort of state on down that quick, you know. We had the Queen video conferencing in the 80s, and she was fat. She's, I think people just keep missing the fact that, you know, first email in the 1970s, first video conference in the 80s, when we when we opened that gallery of communication in the Science Museum, she came in and opened it and tweeted, you know, that's pretty good for a 90 year old. So um, I kind of miss her, and she's gone, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so where from here, Stephen? What, what, what are you sort of uh, pushing? How are you pushing this out, and the links you're making? And well, it's a kind of manic time at the moment um, because I'm also trying to rebuild higher education a bit. We, we've taken that old um, workplace degree we built in 2006, where you studied your full time work. So whatever you do full time becomes the focus for your three years of undergraduate life. And you end up with a degree which is learning technology research colon what I do. Um, and that was was a bit of a battle to get people to recognise that full time work was also full time study. But we did it in spades and we ran it for a, well we ran that for over a decade. And um, one of the big surprises there, as with Knoxville, was the quality of the work that was produced. I remember we we were very worried that a lot of our undergraduates were getting first class honours. 
So we had to call the other universes to moderate. We said, look, they're all getting first. And they said, no, 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 no your market scheme is all wrong. More of them should be getting first. You're, <laughs> you're being too much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that wasn't what, we, wasn't what we wanted to hear. <laughs> and the same with not, you know, the, the kids as a cohort outperform the schools that really chucked them out in the first place. You know? So they, I, I say often on, on interviews like this that uh, we never know how good kids can be. But when we surprise them with the challenge we give them, they astonish us like that with what they do. We've seen that in space with the, um, with the virus um, month and beyond. Uh, so I'm trying to mend higher education a bit. Nothing wrong with higher education as it is, but it needs its other bit as well. I'm also doing some geeky stuff here about them, trying to build, I don't know if I can make this work briefly for you, it's slightly insane, but um, I'm sort of interested in, uh, I was building this between the stuff in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> doing wearable tech, you know? and uh, this was a little device that allows your, 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 um, your headband, you know, responds to proximity. Um, you know, cue interesting debate about whether that's Islamically acceptable or not. It is because it's drawing attention to somebody else, not this. <laughs> but it dawned on me that, that it would be jolly handy if kids had, you know, could have a badge they're wearing and the badge would measure proximity of others. Um, and, and we're looking at near field stuff for that. So you imagine a bunch of kids all wearing a badge and, and they sort of gamify it, you know, it flashes amber if you get a bit near and goes red if you're too near and there's a score on it at the end of the day you can keep your score under under five that's pretty good you know um, so we're having a bit of a bash of building all that at the moment um, we're doing furniture because there's all that work with indoor furniture um you know people aren't going to be sitting on tiered seats shoulder to shoulder anymore so that you know it, it stands to reason if you've got 30 kids and you can only get eight in the classroom at a time the rest of them are going to be outside somewhere and, that means we need outdoor furniture. So I'm in the throes of all that. We were, we were here building, um, putting sensors into furniture because we were trying to encourage children to move. You know, so your chair would tell you to fidget more. <laughs> Is it good for your brain? Well, now the kids are scampering around outside. We don't need that so much, you know. And then, of course, we've also got the. Um, we've been doing all this work on our little learnometers as well. You know, which which measure um, temperature and CO2 uh, and so on. The CO2 in here is pretty good. Um, but we, we've got them going outside as well. It's one of the great things about outside learning is it's a lot better cognitively than inside learning, the light levels, CO2, the pollution. And, you know, so we're, so we're doing all that. So it's all, it's all gone a bit mad here at the moment, really. <laughs> I was in bed. Was in bed last night, just got out the bath, had a phone call from Saudi Arabia. They're like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and they're sort of slightly off course for their 2030 vision of, you know, leading the world with learning. So, I don't know. Anybody, I think, is saying, hmm, this was the moment of realization. And coming out of the moment of realization, what does it look like? And, you know, it is, like, if you know me, it's never going to be a revolution, it's going to be evolution, but. Some of the things we were doing were palpably man, and some of the things we were doing worked rather well. You know. And the, and I think I think there needs to be space for that. Can you tell us what the, what the website for the free school is? Yeah, it's scholarliberum.org, O-R-G. So scholar, um, S-C-H-O-L-A, no R in it, liberum, L-I-B-E-R-U-S, scholarliberum, all one word, dot org. And you'll see all the stuff. It's actually, the site is evolving as we speak. If you look at the um, last updated bit at the bottom of the page, you'll see it's, it's constantly changing. Um, but we're pretty close to, um, about this week, it goes out to everybody and they're saying, what do you think? Give us some feedback on this. And we've got a lot of families who want to be part of it. And my belief is, I mean, just... I'm getting old enough to be allowed to be a little credit, I think. But my belief is that 2.2 billion children in the world and they're heading for half of them, their experience of learning is pretty poor. You know, if you're a girl in Pakistan, in Kashmir, you know, you've got nothing. 
25 million kids and no teacher, no, no school, no building, and for the girls, you know, historically no intention to educate. Well, they're not going to have the capital to be able to ape Western models of learning with the building schools for the future, palaces of learning that were, I was part of building, they're fabulous, but they're a bit pricey, <laughs> and they're not going to have that. What they'll end up with is a sort of subset of, you know, a hundred kids sitting in a room passing pages of the textbook. Now we've got to just see them very much. However, the model we put in place with North School and have now built on with Scholar Live, I can get those kids learning tomorrow. And they don't need a lot of bandwidth to do it because it's asynchronous, so the stuff's only got to get to them eventually. And anyway, Kenya, they've got Project Loom for the balloons. We've got the star train flying overhead. I mean, ubiquitous bandwidth is coming out as fast, you know. So my belief is that scholars, if one other thing they can do is to give learning to those ingenious kids, those creative kids who've never been part of learning before. And anybody can see at this point when we've got a virus at the gates, the flood warning, I live by the sea, the flood warning throughout the day, the tide's going to be too high. Um, you know, there's a there's, there's problem after problem coming straight at us. The only way we're going to fix that is with every kid and every chance of being as smart as they can possibly be. And my belief is that Scholar Liberum is part of the jigsaw that's going to let that happen. Um, I've got no, I've got no financial business model for this at all. I just, I'm put in mind of talking to the guy that set up Skype, which we're using now. And I said, uh, Nicholas, what was your business model? Because I've been asked, as if I cared, but I've been asked to ask him. That and he, right smile, he said, well, we launched it. We were about three weeks ahead of the competition when we launched it. He said, and um, uh, we figured that if half the phone calls in the world ended up being through Skype, we probably wouldn't need a business model. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, he's got a very big boat, so I think he's probably right. <laughs> so just build it, put it out there, and worry about how we fund it later. <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much for the talk this morning. It's been really enlightening. It's a, it's a pleasure. I value so much what we've done all, all over the years, and uh, you know, giving people access to this, just give yourself a pat on the back. Nobody else is going to do it. Nobody there. You know, That's right. We, we, well, we, people need to see alternatives, I think. It's always useful. It's